I must say, I'm lucky to be here. Michigan is not a great spot in January. <coughs> and it's a delight to come down here. I think about sending psychoanalytic knowledge about development, and I, I would like to think that adult analysts would very much like to hear it. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's pretty critical to outcomes. And we'll talk a little bit tonight. Uh, this is a great big topic. And if I were to do it all over again and pull development together in a shorter DVD, I might just choose the thread of separation. Thread. T-H-R-E-A-D. Thread. Through um, development. Every stage is a little bit different. Separation anxiety is varies. We're going to talk tonight about the little kid who goes to school and gets a school phobia when he's in the first grade and he gets a new wave of separation. He's done great in nursery school. He's been gone from his mom for two hours a day and uh, gets another whole wave of it. Uh, and then tomorrow we'll talk about adolescence and the incredible separation, internal separation issues mm -hmm. of tossing out all of the interjects and identifications and saying, I'm going to take it back and be my own man or woman. Um, and it, it all is predicated on an understanding of separation in an adult patients too. The other thing, of course, that's true about psychoanalytic knowledge, and we were talking about it in the car, um, is that it's so dis disseminated in the culture that it doesn't get any credit anymore. The Novik's uh, about three or four years back gave a lecture, a lecture at the Association for Child Psychoanalysis called Taking Back the Land, mm -hmm. which some of you may have heard. Uh, it had to do with, you know, the old idea of trying to recover the swamps in Holland and Amsterdam, um, but it had to do with, you know, reminding ourselves that's really a psychoanalytic principle. All of toilet training right now, all of early child rearing, all of the you know, issues about uh, proper uh, management of young children is predicated on psychoanalytic knowledge. But it's so disseminated, everybody's sort of rediscovering America. Like it never existed before. It always amazes me to, to read in the standard parenting magazines. I'd like to pick them up and take a look and see what new version of what we already knew is there. Um, so with that, we'd start with the idea of latency, which is really the elementary school child. Um, and Freud called it latency, and it's sort of plagued us ever since. Because the only thing he could do at the time when he first wrote about it, and he altered that over time, uh, was think, huh, these children are no longer the clingy, babyish types of three, four, and five. These children are able to be school children and learn. They're not so sensual. They're not so overexcited. They are really when they're very, you know, six-ish is tough. But they must be because there's a diminution in drive mm -hmm. when you're trying to teach psychoanalytic theory, drive includes sort of central behavior, aggressive be impulses, different impulses from both categories. So drive, we'll use drive. Um, and on first inspection, what we see as educators or parents is that the child has to move from his first society in the family, where he is one of several, to the next society, which is one of many. And that's very tough if you see a little kid. I mean, kindergarten, interestingly enough, in our culture, is not a legal year. If you don't send your kid to kindergarten, the first legal year is at six. And I'll tell you a little bit about what other countries and cultures do about educable children. Um, but the challenge is really some major shifts in development um, 
from that first society of the family to the second society, where you're one of many in school. And the standing in line and being told not to touch the kid in front of you and not to punch the kid behind you and just be one of many is a huge, big shift. And there's no point doing it too soon, most cultures have found. Um, theoretically and classically, um, but it's also observable that this is, you know, occurs at the same time with the establishment of sort of a functional conscience, what we call superego. It's really part of the ego, and tonight's lecture is largely about the ego, uh, and that is your adaptive capacity or your brain. Um, but if we can use ego in that light tonight, it's adaptive capacity, both conscious and unconscious, um, and defense, which is part of your ego or your adaptive capacity. And defenses are unconscious. Um, but a child isn't really educable in want, to be one of many until he has a sort of a functional superego or conscience meaning that he's incorporated the identifications and the interjects from his parents about how to be, and he can carry them with him internally. He's got a little bit of a policeman inside. That's the first time, really, that he can really make use of an outside education uh, to any extent. And it occurs during this resolution of the Oedipus complex, where the child essentially, and I'm going to, I'm going to, sort of minimize it in an unfair way, but essentially uh, the child's decided, I can't run this house after all. And I have a very interesting youngster that I've observed over a number of years, um, who at five and a half was going to run the house. He really was going to run the house. He wanted his professor dad's <coughs> lectureship. He wanted to give the papers. He wanted to collect the salary. And it was very unfair that he could not do this. Um, I, I'm the boss. Well, you can't be the boss of everything, Mac. You really can't. No, no, I'm the boss. This is not fair. Uh, you know, by eight he was just mortified at what the memories of what he was like at five and a half. He had given up a lot of that sense, and he had really moved on, and he was a great soccer player, and you know, good at computer gaming, and he had friends, and they had play dates, and he rode his bike, and he did all the things that latency age kids mm -hmm. do, and he was trying to repress being five and a half. Um, everyone agrees that there's at least two phases in this division, and I think if you think about that as a therapist or a teacher or a student of children, it's a little easier, because I'm, you know, Mac was that first stage, the say five to seven or eight, Everybody agrees. If you're a neurobiologist, or if you're a psychologist, if you're a teacher, if you're an analyst, and then 8 to 10 or 11, depending on when puberty is going to strike. Uh, and I would say, this is on the basis of eager growth that you notice this. Um, again, I'm talking adaptive capacity and defense. And as a digression, uh, what Freud thought was the biologic diminution of drive, sexual and aggressive energy, uh, was probably, and this, this might get me in big trouble with old classicists, was probably uh, indeed a biologic phenomenon, but mostly brain <coughs> neurobiology. Uh, because there's many brain indicators, but there's a big shift during this five to seven, seven and a half time. Uh, in myelinization, which is final, uh, at that time by eight before eight. Uh, if you can see it, if you you know do see the Pigetian shift, Piaget found that these kids go very gradually between five and seven from pre-operational thinking to concrete operations. Well, concrete operations allow you you know your thinking to be stabilized, and you can frame it to apply and categorize experience. And you can't really do that before. You're in the moment too much. But that all happens between five and seven and a half or eight. Um, 
Shapiro and Perry in the PSC in the mid-70s, uh, as early as that, pulled together uh, a lot of material from brain studies and cognitive studies to show that brain tissue and functional changes um, that make it possible, in fact, uh, to settle the Oedipal disappointments and move on with the identifications with the adults. Uh, and the new superego, which is very primitive and very rigid in your five and a half year old. Um, but history shows that nobody tries to, to distinguish the child as a separate thinker till close to seven. Uh, we have our six year olds and we can talk about them, but history shows that many cultures independently discover uh, these advances in competence right around this time, the brain changes. Uh, in the Middle Ages, seven was the year you were sent to court. You were seven years old as a page. Um, you were sent as an apprentice, be it with the knacker, the butcher, you know, the miller, whatever you were going to be sent. You were not sent till seven. Um, the Catholic Church ruled seven. Is the age of reason. Right. Yeah. And in Russia, formal school still doesn't start until seven. In the U.S., we start formal school at six. But look at them. I mean, if you're a first grade teacher, what you realize is that this is a motor intelligence, and it's not altogether translated into a sublimation. They don't sit still. They have tremendous issues with drive. Uh, they learn only by walking around their desk. A good first, aid, first grade teacher would never have a child sit very long. They cannot do that. Uh, most of it is still connected with early learning, which is all motor. Everything a baby or a toddler learns is connected with the motor activity. 65% uh, of first graders chew their nails. Blows me away, but it's true. Uh, they're hair twirlers and hair pullers, and they jitter. Uh, and all of this is drive energy as they find a way to suppress, like a sensual drive, or to masturbate with the old Oedipal fantasies. We'll talk more about masturbation. Um, but then I think Freud would, would not be at all offended with the idea that a lot of the mastery of this is not the diminution of drive, but probably a neurobiological function, a brain function. Uh, the estrogen levels and the androgen levels in latency age boys and girls are about the same, and they stay about the same until puberty, where obviously the estrogens go up high in the girls and not in the boys, who eventually gain a lot more testosterone, a lot more androgens. Um, what we do see, of course, is a stage-wise increase in, in ego adaption uh, that makes it look like the drive pressure is under control and seems to enforce repression, allowing latency, which probably is a tough term if you're trying to teach in the medical school or whatever. Um, well, the, the, ascent, this, the essential issues of uh, the resolution of the Oedipus complex, uh, and I've talked about a little bit about that with Mac and his giving up on his longings to run the show, take over from his dad, uh, and the conscience formation. Uh, they're very primitive at first, but we, we can send them to school. Uh, what I mean about primitive is everybody ends up with a conscience as they settle the, the Oedipus complex. Um, however, it doesn't make any sense at first. If you ask a five and a half year old what should happen, as I said before in the earlier conscience development lecture, what should happen to a child who steals something from another kid's backpack, at five, you know, he should go to jail. 
and it's very rigid and moral education has got to be a lot more educational about making reparations. We'll talk about that with parenting. Uh, if you ask a nine-year-old what should happen, he's got a very sophisticated conscience. And he'll say, put it back. Just put it back. Don't say anything. Just put it back. Um, very different. And you see the growth. However, it's always there. So when you think about the adult patient, the beginning rigidity, for better, for worse, and what the interjects are, and they can be quite pathological and very rigid, uh, are there. Now, you add to it as you go. I mean, we don't think anybody should go to jail for stealing the teacher's pencil. Uh, but the voice is always there. So you see in regression some of your patient's remnants from a conscience that didn't make any sense. Um, brain growth and subsequent cognitive leaps are simultaneous and they must contribute to the capacity to move to the next societal group and develop the superego interjects and identifications that make the child increasingly independent of the policeman outside. He's now inside, for better or for worse. Um, so he's kind of gone from saying the boy, oh mommy, I love you, of the five-year-old. And they do, they, I mean, they take their mom's face in their hands and say, I love you, to, you know, a more, oh mom, don't nag. And the girls, you know, in a very permissive household. Five, I can remember a colleague coming to me. My five-year-old asked me last night, Mommy, when will you die? And it was all it had to do with, you know, well, when do I take over the household? Those kinds of things can <coughs> impress. The child moves on um, and becomes one of many with whole new standards. There's a wave of separation fears first grade, second grade, are the times that I see the most children with school phobias that are more transient. Kids with bigger problems, sometimes they come later, uh, but usually that's when you see it. Uh, and there's great pressure to get control. And you feel very sorry for first grade teachers who have to be very special kinds of people. Just like seventh grade teachers have to be very special kinds of people. But these are very sexy children, I want you to remember. They have not lost their drive or their curiosity, and much of learning will be predicated on that curiosity. Um, and the fact that they are very interested, and they are struggling against masturbating. Now, I see parents of children of five, six, or seven, and they contend their children have never touched themselves. I wonder what was said to those children at daycare. Uh, mostly, I see that children are touching themselves. You hear the lady in the line at Kroger's, George, get your hands out of your pants. And they gradually learn that that's not acceptable. And even if you don't tell them, they worry that it's not acceptable. Not the action, but the fantasy that goes with it. What's exciting to them could be naughty. Uh, so masturbation has now gotten connected to fantasy forever in your child patients, your adult patients. Uh, but these are sexy children. Um, in the first latency period, just so you have the standard theory, there are defenses against pregenital. That's being mommy's little child, the oral phallic elements and genital, which means the more grown-up, focused feelings, that it feels good to fantasize with a fantasy about a human being and genital contact. Um, about the third grade, they've moved on and they're eight-ish. Uh, they, that's about when I start hearing that they've fallen in love with their teacher, both the boys and the girls. Uh, there's an androgynous quality to the girls. It's okay to be a tomboy. 
and latency if you're a girl. Masculinity is much more at risk in the sense that children, that male children very much fear the castration um, in their own fantasy life. Uh, and have a very different feeling about being a winner, our winner than a little girl who would remain a fairly phallic little girl. You know, they're the ones with their hands up. Look at me, look at me. I got the answer. And they do. They really do. Um, and they both fall in love with their teachers. So latency is a time when parents do well, and we can talk about parents tomorrow, uh, where it's very important the other grown-ups that are now put in front of the child as they try to master their separateness and make new connections and identifications. <coughs> Everybody in the educational community is working toward the ideal latency, and that would be a successful warding off of sensual demands and aggression. Now, we don't want that to be the case, really. Um, we don't want all impulses to be alienating. Um, but if you're a therapist, it's a very tricky business. And many of these children do need treatment for conflict uh, from earlier phases. But you can't just go for the impulse. They have barely got them under control. And they're symptomatic because the impulses are popping up around. What you go for, and we do this with adult patients too, but not like within latency, we go for the affect and we go for the defense. We might never get to the impulse. Yeah, they got them. They feel sexy. They feel like masturbating. They, they have these fantasies that they think might not be so great about winning or showing off or... Uh, you're doing someone in, but it's the defense and the affect that get them into trouble. Um, so I think that taking up the issue of what's hurting their feelings, um, how sad they are or hurt, um, is more important in the beginning than the defense. You know, I see you have to pretend you don't care when you've hurt somebody, but you know, I think you do feel bad later when you hurt somebody and don't apologize and don't fix it. And that's how you have to go about it, uh, for them to be able to deal with the impulse. Uh, that's what makes treating latency children uh, a particular project, but it's a very good piece of learning for anybody training <coughs> grown -ups the defense and the effect. Uh, by the time they get older and their ego or their adaptive capacity is adaptive, they're very boring until you recognize as a therapist that you're dealing with the defense against very important disruptions in their development. I mean, how many games of sorry can you play before you're tearing out your hair? Uh, how do you go about it? It's a very interesting piece of learning. Uh, they don't want to give up their defense, so they, it, it just feels boring, this repetition in the, in the games, and, the, and sooner or later they will begin to relax. Um, just like sexual enlightenment early in the child's life, it's very good. You know, you're an intelligent, well-brought-up child in Ann Arbor, where I come from, can tell you how babies are made, how they get out. Um, they can give you the whole thing. It doesn't change anything regarding their early childhood fantasies. And you will still be working with bits and pieces of what they've made of their early fantasies about oral impregnation. They swallowed a seed, the baby popped out the belly button, you know, the father, oh heavens, the father, and, and all those different variations. Uh, and again, this whole issue of their sexual curiosity and learning, uh, they have such, these little folks have such rigid primitive consciences that uh, at first there's just this identification with the aggressor and this projection of guilt. 
Yet they'll spill their milk and they'll point at their mother and say, you made me spill it. They feel so bad. It's ridiculous. Uh, or the devil made me do it. Um, there's these temporary regressions. Um, hopefully they'll get to their reaction formations. It's a common defense in latency. Oh, that's disgusting. The reactions are really solid. Uh, what the teachers are all hoping, and the parents are all hoping, is that they'll get to the sublimations pretty soon. Sublimations being a defense you can deal with. I mean, it's, it's one where you have the energy, but it's this great energy. I mean, when we think of a happy childhood, we think of our latency years. Uh, nobody remembers much about their puberty except the factual things that happen. Uh, because it's so hard to think about and look at. Uh, but you, if you remember a happy childhood, you remember it from about 7 to 10. And you sat on the front steps and played chess. And you rode your bikes for miles. And nobody cared what you did as long as you were back by the time the street lights came on. Do you remember that? That was the happy childhood. And we, if you don't learn to love learning, e.g., sublimate during that time, it's exceedingly hard to recover. Adolescents don't recover well from a really disrupted elementary school time of life. Um, so, I've talked a little bit about the temporary regressions um, in this first phase, and the fact that you'll see every aspect of the greediness, messiness, showing offness, how many cartwheels can you do in a minute, you know, that kind of thing, and the book bag in the middle of the foyer, even though you've said a hundred times, get the book bag out of the middle of the foyer. They won't get the book bag out of the middle of the foyer until they're probably seven or eight or nine. Um, in this second phase, of course, the ego defenses, the adaptive defenses, have grown. Um, there's some sexual exploration that you won't ever see. Um, their masturbation is easily forgotten. You might see it. You know, you might see the nine-year-old walking down the hall with his zipper down. Who knows what he was doing? Uh, but you're not apt to see too much of it. Uh, the sublimations resulting in mastery are very pleasurable. Mastery, and we'll talk about that some tomorrow, is really the way to approach children and parents. Um, we think sublimation. But mastery makes sense to parents. Everybody feels good when they can master something. And that's how you deal with little kids, is mastery. Well, that's how these kids are dealing every day. Every time they can do something better in the real world, they get more solid in keeping down the pregenital impulses and the pull back to be a little kid and the genital impulses, which probably are naughty. Um, by the second phase, the superegos, this conscience, which is just a, really a part of your adaption, uh, if you're going to live in society, has gotten much grayer, reliable, but not so hard on you. Um, did you got a C on that because you turned it in late? Eh, it's not the end of the world, you get a B next time. Um, and during this time, an important thing that's going on, we'll talk a lot about it in adolescence, is that parents are being devalued realistically. I mean, the time the five or six year old hits the neighborhood, he's recognized that there's somebody down the block that has a bigger car. Somebody else's dad has a bigger car. And by the time he's seven, he's recognized that somebody in the neighborhood or somebody's mother brings to school a lot tastier cookies than his mother or her mother. Uh, he begins to make comparisons and he begins to begin a sort of realistic devaluation. Uh, that's sometimes kind of hard on the parents who have been gods up to that point uh, and a huge source of the child's self-esteem. My daddy is, or my mom is, is part of one's whole essence. A latency child 
is trying to get it separate. And we'll talk a little bit about the literature they love. Um, because they are now going to have to be special on the basis of who they are. Um, but these eight to ten year olds in this second phase, they're kind of content in their world of rules and peer groups and roles uh, and this whole idea of, okay, go explore, come home when the street lights are on, as they take off on their bikes. Uh, you see the defense, but you don't see the impulse much anymore. Uh, but the latency ch child's job, in spite of what you see on the outside, is to ward off drives and regression. Uh, at night, they will still want their teddy bears. Um, in treatment, again, it's defense analysis and it's boring and so on. Uh, trauma in early latency in adults. Uh, what you'll see in the adult is this identification with the aggressor, the protect, projection of guilt. You know, it's really somebody else's fault that, that all these things happen. Uh, an over strict but not reliable conscience or superego. Uh, and they may look borderline kind of at first, I mean, in the classical sense. But upon analysis, you will find that, in fact, the trauma and the disruption was really right there in that early phase of latency. Um, we often assume that conflict in adults comes from unsettled business and pre oedipal and Oedipal functioning. Uh, but major disruptions, overwhelmings, chronic stress, and latency can impede the most sturdy child's development and distort defenses against pregenitality and Oedipal conflicts into their maturity and leave lasting fixations. Uh, it reminds me of a whole series of patients we wrote up that uh, lost parents in latency. And these were intact with families and they were rapid losses, the remaining parent had a hard time coping. Uh, and these children, these, I would see them as adults, and they were very much like latency children. They just couldn't move into the next phase and master. Um, and it's a little hard to say why. They made it to college. They seemed to have made the separation from away from home, but they never really did. Uh, and I think that the whole trauma did occur in latency and not previously. Um, now the plays, the most fun part of thinking about latency children are the different study groups we had on children's literature and games. And when you think about latency children, you think about their motor intelligence early on. That's when they learn to jump rope. Uh, and the rhythmic, I mean, you can see the compromise formation, they're learning a skill, the, the motor system is engaged, uh, and they're expressing a number of impulses. It, there's whole books on nursery rhymes in different cultures, and the contents are very telling. Do you remember the one about judge, fudge, fudge, tell the judge, mama's got a baby, not a girl, not a boy, just a plain old baby. You wrap it up in tissue paper. And they're doing this to jump up. Send it down the elevator, first floor, miss. Second floor, miss. All the impulses are there. Get rid of the kid. There's no castration. And if you read nursery rhymes, or if you read jump rope, and listen to jump rope rhymes on the playground, it's astonishing. Um, but the early books that they'll sit and listen to anyway for a while uh, tend to have animal characters like Frances. Do you remember uh, the Frances story? She's a little badger. She gets into trouble and then she has to make it up and uh, then Winnie the Pooh, all of the Pooh characters, they get into terrible binds and they're rescued by a five-year-old. Mm. That makes you feel important. A five-year-old keeps... Christopher Robin keeps rescuing them. Um, 
The Berenstein Bear books, which I find just straight out moralizing, they love. Peter Rabbit, how terrifying. They love Peter Rabbit. Uh, this is the time, you know, you could, you could think of a whole lecture on the family romance. The family romance occurs early in latency, and it is a theme in all of the more advanced latency books. Uh, the family romance is when a child realizes that his parents might be disappointing, and he's not quite ready to threaten his self-esteem with their omnipotence. Mm -hmm. And he begins to imagine, or she begins to imagine, that really these aren't my parents. I was born of royal blood, mm -hmm. and I've been kidnapped or landed here. Every story they're intrigued with. I mean, the Rollin lady is rich on the basis of a family <laughs> romance. Harry Potter ends up with the Dursleys for a These terrible people. But he is a royal wizard. His parents were killed by the death. Everything is included in this. It's scary. Harry masters everything. Uh, he's royal. He's marked with the royalty of the struggle his parents had. Um, but there's many, many other stories. Uh, Sarah Crew was a favorite in Secret Garden. I mean, they, there's classic stories. Heidi and Heidi grows up and all the things that people love as children um, carry this family romance thread. It gets much more sophisticated over time. Um, the, Philip, the Philip Pullman books um, very popular with children. I find them wildly gory and scary, uh, but they like that. I mean, they're trying to master their own impulses. Um, I'm speaking of, what are the three? There's, there's the spyglass and the compass and the knife, if you've read those. The mother in them, Lyra's mother is um, really scary. The split is there between the witch and the good mother mm -hmm. uh, that a girl struggles with as she gets toward puberty. Uh, and this whole issue of trying to get one's soul and selfhood into oneself as a separate person with the demons. I don't know if you've read those books, but every child has a demon. And, and the demons are actually animals. They represent their character, an eagle or a ferret or, you know, a dog or a cat. Quite wonderful family romance stories. Um, so the all by myself gets more and more important in the later latency years. You know, they're, they're animals and they're very displaced. Uh, but so obviously that they're the child struggling to control himself. Uh, pretty soon uh, they become children out in the world who can master anything without any grown up help. Like the Lemony Snicket books, the Baudelaire children who have to master things all by themselves against the wicked grown ups. Uh, and their wonderful parents are dead and left them with um, some kind of bequest. Um, the favorite girl stories have always been uh, the mother is just not there. Like Nancy Drew. I can't even remember with all the Nancy Drew stories. Is the mother dead? I think the mother's dead, <laughs> yes. And she and her father solved these mysteries. and. Um, Great, with great popularity, almost every latency child has read some of these series. Um, the mother is either dead or fairly irrelevant. She makes sandwiches and sends them on the adventure. Uh, with the older boys, they want their sports stories. Uh, there's a whole series of them which involves their exhibitionism and their triumph separate from their parents through an acceptable sport. Uh, 
And there's a lot of assimilation in these stories with disappointment and triumphs. Uh, playing gets, you know, why do we play? You could do a whole lecture on play. Uh, why do we play? Why do they play? Um, in some instances early <coughs> on, it's so easy to see. They're assimilating piecemeal. Uh, what could not be managed all at once. Um, that's what you see just in the scene between a good nursery school and formal school entry. And for quite a while after that, the, the doctor visit played over and over and over. They're usually the doctor or the dentist. And you can think how gratifying. You know, the doctor gets to know all this sexy stuff, but they were also trying to master sometimes their shots, sometimes, God forbid, medical procedure. Uh, they're playing the dentist, they're playing the teacher who's powerful and telling them to sit down and be quiet. Uh, they're playing the mom. Latency girls make very much this identification with their moms and they become sort of caricatures of their moms, bossy and efficient. Um, and they're turning passive into active. They play the angry parent with the doll and so on. Um, so they're reworking their helplessness and their anxiety uh, to get the inside threat and the outside threats under control. Uh, but a lot of play is just for pleasure and solidifying ego skills and gratifying fantasy, uh, even if it's identifying with the aggressor and mastery. It, in order for a child to thrive, he has to get pleasure out of mastering hard things if he's going to make any kind of optimal adjustment to his considerable, and they're all smart, his considerable potential. Um, a joyless latency is a tremendous lid on an individual's potential. Um, you see the endless model airplanes and the Lego constructions and the forts and the inventing your own paper dolls and whole wardrobes. Uh, it's such an investment. You cannot remember your own investment in your projects as a latency child. But the child is completely involved. You call them for lunch. They don't want lunch. They want their project. This is all the investment is in the mastery. And the fantasy that goes with it, which may not be entirely conscious. And eventually, the sublimating gets further from the impulses. And it's then that they, they seem so boring to treat. But it's because they haven't yet caught up to the defenses. Uh, because they're into board games and chess and collections. And how many, how many Civil War soldiers can you paint and still keep your attention? Um, <coughs> But the play is very pleasurable, and it's done without censure. Nobody yells at you for creating, you know, the Union Army in the South in great detail with gold buttons. Um, play is very important in this regard, uh, and it's not free association for a child. Uh, it, it's a child's way or medium of being. I mean, the analyst doesn't get to say, well, the, the associations in the play is just like adult. It, there's too many derivatives to it. Uh, you have to start at the top of it. It's a child's way of being. Then um, you're not going to assault them with saying how they must feel. Um, you're going to go for the affect. Yes, that somebody's feelings were hurt. We'll talk in displacement about whose. Um, We'll look at our acquired accomplishments here because they're very easily lost by the regressive pull backwards. Uh, we analyze the effect and the defense and so on. Um, we have to remember that play is overdetermined and it's repetitive. Very repetitive play may indeed contain conflict or unmastered trauma or fantasy and is connected maybe to masturbatory activities and worried about it, worries about it. Um, and again, remember, play at first is motoric. All early experience 
involves the big motor system. Later on, it doesn't go away. It just is refined. You know, they're out on the streets playing kick the can and dodgeball and hide and seek. And eventually, that hide and seek becomes very sophisticated soccer and tennis. Uh, they play capture the flag. They play it after dark with flashlights. Uh, so hide and seek becomes very sophisticated. Uh, at the time. They get into second or third grade. What you begin to see is something that educators have a very hard time with. And it's really not a moral issue as much as educating the child out of the dilemma, is they begin to scapegoat. Now, scapegoating uh, is a very ugly scene for us grown ups. And what we'll be doing is teaching children to be able to be inclusive, to tolerate the weaknesses or disabilities of other children, uh, to be empathic, to identify with us and our caring. But the scapegoating is a desperate early effort to get the badness out of me and onto somebody else. It's somebody else that's damaged or castrated. Or, and it has to be educated out of. But it is a very normal, rapid defense when you get children together in the school years. Um, some, just a few words about masturbation. Um, some theorists, anyway, suggest that uh, it's the boy's fear of castration or injury uh, that causes the relinquishment of the Oedipal complex. Max struggled to run the family and replace his father. Uh, for women, uh, that it causes the Oedipal complex. Well, I'm really a woman. My mother likes being a woman. I'd love to be my daddy's woman, and we'll have a baby together kind of Oedipus complex is where the theoretical bent goes. Uh, And again, in you know summary, the first stage is very much complicated in latency by a need to defend against genital and pregenital impulses, and a superego that's rude and mean and a foreign body. The second phase, the conflict is down, the defenses are up, and it's part of an ego adaption. Um, the superego becomes much more flexible. The child becomes truly separate, and tolerates the fact that his family is imperfect and he's not perfect, uh, and is very proud of the fact he can play by the rules. In fact, the rules are more important in the game by the end of latency, and he's looking for his place in the outer, her place in the outside world. He has many, many gratifications in his new skills or her new skills among peers. However, however, the urge to masturbate with its contention fantasies persists. It's just got a very much bigger brain, more adaptive capacity. Greta Bornstein comments, the child will occasionally do so. Uh, he sh should also con consciously try to avoid it, uh, this breakthrough of impulse, but should not be preoccupied with the struggle. You can you can see different people's edginess about it. Uh, if the child was just overtly sexual all the time, one would say, I suppose if you were a theorist, that he was not sublimating, he was not using that energy, he was not trying to get those things under control and move on. Uh, Dr. Nahara had mentioned the issue of computer education in children and there's many difficulties we haven't worked out yet about what to do with computers and children. I have treated several adolescents who are truly addicted to the computer as masturbatory equivalents sometimes, as just ways um, to avoid some of the tasks of separation and being one of many. Um, 
to master and stimulate, it becomes really an addiction. So it's, it can be diverted when pathology is already there into something that's really a problem. Um, and I've seen a lot of parents now, almost every parent I see is punishing children for misbehavior in the latency years by saying, I'm going to take away your computer privileges for the night. <coughs> now, nobody ever said in the old days, go to your room till you got yourself under control and don't read your book. But they're saying, go to your room, you can't play in your computer. And there's a reason for this. We don't altogether understand it, but I'm very curious how we will work this out, the overstimulation and blatant impulses that these kids get into with the different kinds of video games. Now, learning, obviously, is wonderful. The fact that they're going to be able, eventually, to pull up any book that they want at a moment's notice and reread that page about triumphing over the dragon or whatever it is, is wonderful. Um, but the, the passive onlook, onlooker and the kind of turning passive into active that happens in latency um, and the tendency to not have to work it out with peers is always something to consider. And the fact that latency, at least early on, is a lot of motor learning and discharge. Um, so, that's enough. <laughs>
the knowledge is increasing more. I didn't know about the spurt of brain development yeah. in latency. If you, if you can give me that uh, <coughs> thing, I appreciate it. Yeah, there is another one mm -hmm. in adolescence, about 13, 14, 15 years of age. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is a very significant one and very visible because it's uh, now with the imaging studies and some mm -hmm. people have been able to People in the National Institute of Mental Health, this is not analysts that are speculating about anything. These are neuroscientists. Uh, mm -hmm. really yeah, we always knew that Piaget formalized that knowledge that by 14 or 15, a child is as smart as they're ever going to get. Mm -hmm. Their brain really finally gets to hypothetical thinking. We could tell that. We couldn't yeah. do the brain imaging, but we knew they could be That's hypothetical right. thinking. Right. You wouldn't think they were too bright because they got no experience and they're kind of impulsive, but they're really smart. They just haven't had the experience. But the other thing that is important about that is that what happens at that age and how that is handled is significant. Mm -hmm. Because that growth spurt is, and the people explain the adolescent reward, which is, of course, the development of the sexual, you know, uh, right. capabilities and so on. And <clears throat> much of the behavior of the adolescent because they don't have enough ego to control these impulses. And that spurt will help to put brains on it and put it in the right, right. Mm -hmm. place and so on. And many people believe that that's what happens. The interesting thing about it is that there is a second problem that we didn't know. And it, then this may be a third problem for all I know, given the latency uh, spurt that you are describing, but there is a second problem in adolescence, which means that the experiences of adolescence, if they are not appropriate and constructive, and if we don't think of what is the best way to utilize to this opportunity to enhance development, we may uh, have these kids suffer an enormous loss when they prone because whatever mm -hmm. is had not been enhanced sufficiently or used sufficiently it will be eliminated forever. That's mm -hmm. your only opportunity yes. to have that. Mm -hmm. yes. Of course we know now that uh, you see when when you were at Michigan, yeah, as a child fellow, I used to tell you Brain development finished at four or five years of age. That's what we believe at the time. Well, mm -hmm. now we know that brain development doesn't finish until the 24th or 25th mm -hmm. year of birth, if it is uh, it, in, in the sense of anatomical oh, changes. changes. Yeah, I don't mean in the sense of learning new things and so on, but in the sense of brain growth, actually, the material, anatomical growth, because the cerebral as a spur of growth at 23, 24 years of age. And uh, again, we used to think that the cerebellum only control uh, equilibrium and mobility and so on, right. when in fact it controls thinking. It helps it goes through. To, to control, to restrain to the executive function, which is essentially in the frontal lobe, is somewhat related to this as well. It orders, just as it orders your mobility, it seems to order your thinking at the same time, which again we didn't know. You see, what you were saying is true. Freud and others, yeah, Jay and everybody that working in those fields, were doing it from the point of view of observation. They were looking at behaviors, but they didn't have the knowledge that neurosciences have been, you know, the producing recently, given the new advances in technology and so on, as you see nowadays, you can study practically anything and see what in the brains get lighted. <laughs> you know, and that tells you what is the complexity of the feeling, or what many, what different parts of the brain are involved, and so on. So we are learning an enormous amount in good time. And as you know, I have an interest in this because. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in how the brain gets put together, mm -hmm. which is something that we don't, uh, really know as well as we will one day, or should perhaps already. But I'm particularly interested in the first year of life, 
and the role of the first two years of life, the role of a stimulation in brain, in brain development. And um, again, what doesn't happen there, the path sequence that are not developed then are not going to uh, be easily developed later on. There are critical periods for certain things. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the best example of that is uh, one of Candle, which was it's a neuroscientist, which knows a lot about psychoanalysis actually, but he's a neuroscientist. And he got a Nobel Prize. He got it by studying how the occipital cortex develop in order to produce the function of vision, particularly depth perception. And that happens after a person is dependent on a variety of forms of stimulation, which then will order these cells in columns in a certain way which allows you then to, if that doesn't happen, it will never happen. It has to happen at that critical period. It doesn't mean to say that you're going to be blind, but it means to say that you're going to have problems with the perception for the rest of your life. And much of the brain, I always say, I was telling the child fellows here at the university uh, on Thursday, that just as once we learn, let's say about vitamins and minerals, you know, and uh, identify them, the large number of these things that are important for health, which there was a time that we didn't know anything about it, but we saw the results of lack of vitamin C and vitamin A, scorbuto, uh, people going blind for lack of vitamin, with certain forms of vitamin A and things of that kind. Once that was known, we have been able to prescribe them, to become cognizant of how important they are, what doses people have to take if they are going to be healthy or they are not going to suffer from certain illnesses and things of that kind. And um, at some point in the future, we will probably have the same amount of knowledge of what is the brain nutriment of a stimulant that is required at what time, in what area, what type, to achieve the idea development of the brain in a human being. And um, so it is really very interesting. The other comment I have, Carol, is, 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 um, is true that the move into one of many, which is the way you describe it, which is a very graphic way of describing it, but at the same time it carries the move away from the parents into a community of peers, which is something they couldn't do before. And the example always is if you take a three-year-old and say, well, mommy's going uh, to the grocery. You want to go and play with Peter? Ah, uh -uh. that's a friend, but his mother is not there. He, uh -uh. he wants to go with his mother. He's mm -hmm. seven, and the mother says, I'm going to the grocery. You want to go to Peter's house? Say, oh, yeah, yeah, let's go to Peter's house. You see, he can. Uh, and that is an important step, but he has a price. Do you remember in the nursery school that we used to have at the University of uh, Michigan in the child analytic program? We had, which was wonderful, we there had a well baby clinic. We had a toddler group, which you were describing. Uh, and we have, of course, two nursery schools, one from children between two and a half and three and a half. And the afternoon was three and a half to five. And um, so we could follow children from the moment of pregnancy of their mother up to the time that they went into the elementary school system. And then we continue to see many of these children because their mother had other children and so they remained in contact. But the people had an opportunity to see this whole span of development, which now is, of course, is practically impossible to do. It was a unique opportunity. But as you remember, we had a rule to enter into nursery school, and there was a capacity of the child to separate from the parent. That's right. If, if, if that was not there, we wouldn't take a child, because then it was a traumatic experience, which is what you were referring to, the different type of separation at what ages and so on. And we soon learned that if you did not assess was this child ready for the separation of a couple of hours a day, mm -hmm. you shouldn't do it. 
the matter if it was three and a half or four at the time, you had to wait until he was able to do that. And some kids could do it at two and a half. Mm -hmm. All the kids couldn't do it until they were four, you know. And we were very careful. And of course there was a transition where we allowed the mothers to be there for, depending on the child needs, you know, the anxiety that the separation provoked, for the mother to be there in the nursery in a corner somewhere so that the child could run away there. With some children didn't need that at all, but some did, you know. And these things really are very important, but not treated with the importance that they have, because I think they have serious consequences in the future, including in the wish to learn or the wish to go to school and so on, because school is a sour experience at the beginning, that, that feeling you with anxiety. Yeah, that learning to it's love not very likely mm -hmm. that you are going to have a great love for for a school and for learning and so on, because you were traumatized by that separation, you know. So all these things have an enormous relevance, and of course latency is a, is a turning point in life. It's, what happens in latency will determine the future, obviously, so. It's well. not that much about, you know, because it seems sort of boring. When it's going well, they're street children. They're yours. I mean, they're always around. They show up for meals. You know, they have to be nagged to clean their rooms and get their shoes out of the foyer. And but this is the time when it's such easy family children. They're just not there. They're playing ball in the backyard, or they, you know, they're digging to China. God knows what. But it's such an easy time. Um, but it's so critical, and it's hard to describe because, of course, these kids have got a desperate hold on. I don't want my impulse life to bother my learning and my sublimation. Uh, and nobody talks much about it. It's absolutely central. Yes. And of course, this whole thing you're talking about, I mean, the women's liberation has been wonderful. Feminism mm -hmm. has been wonderful. But some of the more radical prescriptions were that motherhood be a hobby. <gasps> it can't be a hobby for the first few right. years. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it, it, the glorification of motherhood sort of went away, so it, it, maybe mothers being a bit more conflict about it. Do you remember we had, uh, in the nursery school, we had three teachers, mm -hmm. generally, <clears throat> and not too many children. The more we had, it was about nine uh, nursery school kids, and it never failed. Even the children that were ready to separate, will pick one of the teachers as the preferred person. That's why we have several, you know. And they were different. They they picked them up. One of them was, uh, you remember, a black lady called Laura Bailey, mm -hmm. she was wonderful with children. And some children wanted to pick her up. Mm -hmm. These were not black children, these were white children. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they were so in tools and so attached to her that they will they wanted to be the same coral that she was, and we rubbed with her because they wanted to acquire the coral. And we cried because they couldn't get that coral, you know. <laughs> Which is the, of course, you go three or four years later when prejudice has developed, you know, and that form part of the, the character development, then, of course, they will, they will want to do that, probably. But at that time, it was completely uh, different. Uh, I remember some of these things which I saw. You, you probably remember we had a child. You remember that when you were there? They had two thumbs. Oh. So he had six fingers. You remember that one? Mm -hmm. Six fingers. Mm -hmm. And adults, we saw it and just, just push out. You know, mm -hmm. you know there's some coming out mm -hmm. here. You know, it was kind of, kind of frightening you somehow. You know. <laughs> The other children, all of them wanted another thumb. Yeah. They cried because they, they they couldn't get another thumb. Why? He, I haven't got one. They wanted, you just say, well, but you see how it changed, you know, mm -hmm. and how the concretism of that is patient, more is better, and so on changed. And there are no, there are at such points mostly quantitative. 
assessments rather than qualitative assessments and so on. And to follow this carefully, the problem with our school is that none of this is taken into account. It's, uh, you know, we run the children, let's face it. Right? Education is uh, difficult that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, was, I wanted to ask something that interests, that I think we all have interest. Um, earlier, Carol, you had talked about a study that was looking at hormonal levels, different hormonal right. levels and brain maturation. And, and then Dr. Don had spoken about the innate timing in the unfolding that has to be stimulated as a critical time period. And so one of the things I was curious about, have there been any studies done that show the hormonal level regulation and the development of the brain, like PET scan, and if these are differential between boys and girls, see, does estrogen stimulate a certain part of the brain? Does, I don't know, right? You know, does... I, as I recall, what I read is that the, the levels stay about the same. This was not correlated with brain photography, these old studies. Um, I would have to, to go back and look. But the idea that measuring hormonal studies, it was possible to see that the estrogen was about the same and the androgens mm -hmm. were about the same. Um, and that they did not really deviate until the burden, the hormonal burden of puberty right. hit. Um, Do you understand what I'm getting at? I then? understand what you're getting about, about the changes in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if anybody's done that study. It'd be fascinating. Yeah, it would be fascinating. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, could you say a little bit about fantasy um, and the child's ability to to um, not get swept up in fantasy so much that they believe it um, throughout that period of time from the leaving the Oedipal period and into maybe pre-adolescence? Are there periods of time where you wouldn't be too surprised if a child starts to believe their fantasies? Or like when the hormones start to kick in with pre-adolescence? Is there a regression so that at some points you might have a child getting swept up into their fantasy life and not remembering that their fantasy isn't reality? I mean, could you say a little bit about... Yeah, the phasic part of it, I would say, just in brief, that you know, the ego of a late latency child facing the pubertal onslaught, the big change of the ego being hit with a lot of hormonal pressure, and a lot of body image change with growth spurts and so on, where it's not even the same person for the child. It's, you know, that, at that time, I do not expect the child to have difficulty with reality testing. They, of, of the type, you're talking about a fantasy kind of thing. You know, and we're talking 10 right there, 11. 11. The girls, 10. Right. Yeah, but not boys, 12, 13, 14 often. There's nothing wrong with a 14-year-old boy that's just now starting to get broad-shouldered. Right. Mm -hmm. He may think so, but there's not. Um, I, I, the, ego, the ego there is really ready for the onslaught. Early on, they always forget what they're doing. I mean, they get so overexcited. I mean, every child between 5 and 7 is overstimulated. You just look at them. <coughs> They're jittery and they're get, they get silly really fast. Mm -hmm. uh, now, granted, pubertal girls and boys, but the girls sitting in the back seat together with their best friend mm -hmm. driving nuts. They're giggling. They're just obnoxious. But they're not out of touch mm -hmm. in any way. Um, they're overexcited. It's very different than the five to seven year old mm -hmm. who, who has to be rattled. You know, stop it. You're out of control. Oh, yeah. I really am. I'm off in my fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be symptomatic for a pre-pubertal kid entering puberty to be in the same yeah, I, status. I, I'm, I'm sorting out my thinking about an eight-year-old girl that I have treated with who has uh, anorexia. And she stopped eating after a fall on the ice. She was ice skating. Mm -hmm. And uh, after we did some pretty good work around all the fantasies around oral impregnation and a lot of um, envy and wish to have a penis and a lot of that. She started to eat fine and then some fantasies started to come out that 
were clearly fantasies. I mean, they, they were not reality, but she was certain they were true. And then we spent some time working on them, and then she was able to sort out that what she was fantasizing wasn't real. I'm assuming that was a regression that was... Yeah, I don't know. Without that knowing age. the child, I would be surprised. They were so rigid at that time. Right. Um, it's interesting. It's an ice skating incident. Uh, so often, there's those kinds of connections in anorexic patients, and it's hard to know if the anorexia will continue. Um, most of the anorexic patients I've seen have been girls, and they were skaters, gymnasts, very early with their parents' approbation and more than support. Been very physical, but they were supposed to be very thin. It's not the cause of it. The cause goes way back to control battles and control mm -hmm. issues in the fantasy life of a really small child. Yeah. They're exceedingly, exceedingly hard to budge. The children will all get up to weight in the course of treatment, but they'll, they'll carry this fantasy into their adulthood. It's hard to convince the insurance companies, look, we can keep them from starving, starving to death. That's just a behavioral management issue. Mm -hmm. But the, the damage and distortion of their characters and the fact that they keep this inside, I can control the world by stopping eating, doesn't go away too easy. That's been your experience, I'm sure, Dr. Martin. Coming back to your question, uh, <coughs> I don't know if any of this are probably hormonal levels and uh, brain imaging, but uh, there might be, I, I just, if they are, I haven't come across it. And I watched that literature. No, I know, that's what I was hoping one yeah. of you would. But uh, there are certain things that are interesting. Mm -hmm. For example, Brain development is really predicated in two, well, it's a complex phenomenon, but there are two main factors. One is genetic factor, mm -hmm. how the brain development is controlled by genes. You know, let's say, move neurons to the frontal lobe mm -hmm. now, and it happens at a certain time. And, you know, there is an orderly mm -hmm. sequence, which is genetically determined, that's not accidentally. And as far as we know, it's not hormonally determined, but it's genetically determined. On the other hand, as you know, that's the role of the genetic equipment, but for, uh, that's not enough to complete brain development. It needs a lot of external stimulation. Mm -hmm. And that and the genetic makeup will make the best possible combination. Yet, there is a phenomenon, for example, uh, which again is, is an interesting phenomenon, is related to what you ask. If you think of precocious puberty, mm -hmm which is uh, common, particularly in girls, it's mm -hmm. much rarer in boys. And we have some cases of this in Michigan. I was thinking of the one that, that became pivotal at 18 months. Oh, gosh. And, and hit our ward at eight years old as in a complete elective mute. Oh, my gosh. Do you remember her? Yeah, sure. And here at the, in the University of South Florida, we had a little girl, eight years old, mm -hmm. that was pure. Mm -hmm. started to mess with and all of that. And became came was sent from London mm -hmm. with the daughter of somebody in the Air Force to here to the university they didn't know what to do with her mm -hmm. because she was in a manic episode. Mm -hmm. And in her family there were a lot of bipolar disorders. Mm -hmm. And the moment she hit puberty she was manic and sexual like you wouldn't believe. That was about her being. Mm -hmm. And she would lift her skirt and down her pants and say, you want some? You want some? And, uh, you know, it, it was awesome. Yeah. In the beginning, we thought this guy must have been molested by somebody because it's... Um, but actually, she was manic and she was just fully developed. Uh, on the other hand, you see, I don't think her brain. Okay, that's what the question. You know, yeah. yeah. Okay. Wasn't fully, wasn't yeah. as developed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. No. And uh, so it's it's an interesting question. I know that, like anything else, you see, we don't know much, and this is one of the problems I think of psychiatry today, mm -hmm. which is that uh, it's not uncommon 
to prescribe medication to children that are psychoactive drugs, mm -hmm. you know, in the pharmacological sense of the word. And we don't know what that does to brain development because there is no question that certain things will interfere with the program of brain development that is genetically determined and complemented by the environmental influences. Now, whether an excess of hormonal production, for whatever reason that could conceivably happen, think of this, uh, has may influence that or not, this, as I say, is something that I have no knowledge of, but is certainly worthwhile uh, you know, watching. But there is no question that other substances introduced may have, think of alcohol with their pregnancy, or think of our drugs and so on. And, you know, so all of this obviously is of enormous significance, but we tend to ignore much of it. Dr. Nahara, one of the reasons I ask is the phenomena, and this this one, Tricia, is uh, the phenomena of people who actually kind of like mature later in life. So the genetics were there, and it's, it would, and the stimulation was there, they would not be able to mature later in life. You know, it goes back to what we're talking about, people's brain continuing to develop until 24. Some people just don't really, you know, they're called late bloomers. Don't do it until later. And so I was curious about that and what had to do with with brain development and what are the factors on that. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Because but remember, I that they should be in itself. Mm -hmm. Remember, genes are not stamping concrete. They are variations of genes. Mm -hmm. And if you are going to grow normal, you have to be within a certain... That's a good point. You know, yeah, right. And it's conceivable that mm -hmm. some of these people have a variation that delays the development of certain areas of the brain. But yeah, there is some variability, there is no question about it. But we're learning a lot about it in the next 20 years, a lot yeah. more will be known about it. Yeah. I was just thinking, um, did Freud ever touch upon um, uh, like IQ and his stages. Um, take for example, I work with some students who are severe and profound mentally handicapped. They're they're fully developed, gone through puberty, but cognitively they're you know pre-operational. Does he? Is there any been any correlation between? Them? No, Freud was not. Uh, he was in a different area. That's more mostly uh, Piaget developed that particular area. In the first time, there was no acute testing. Mm -hmm. That came much later. You know, mm -hmm. the wash and uh, you know all of these uh, things came came later. But so, so I have children that they go through all the the stages of Freud, but they they're not aware of the. They they you know it has a lot to do like we were talking about the Piagetian genetics, <coughs> which is the easiest way to talk about it. How much can the brain abstract so that there's some sort of integration of physical growth and the, the demands of drive with what the brain can process and defend and develop sublimations for. So if, if you have a really low IQ, and it worked with a lot of those kids as a consultant in what we call our, our intermediate school district. Um, it's very confusing. You almost have to do an individual, kid by kid, uh, evaluation about how they are understanding their impulse life and how they're managing it. Most of the kids that I work with, they don't, they don't manage their impulses at all, even sexual impulses, and and so our job ones. is to, I guess, sublimate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's just interesting. I think, yeah, I think a lot of that is, is going to be your creativity. You know, there, some of it can be apparently trained. Um, there has to be some gratification in life. They have to figure out where and how, and you have to figure out ways to, to help them use that energy somehow mm -hmm. and control it. But it's going to be creative because I don't think there's any ready formula. You've probably seen a lot more teachers understand that a lot better than I do. That's where you can be very creative. 
because you have the children, you have the experience, and you acquire this all the knowledge. You can use it in a constructive manner. Mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, analysts can do that. They don't handle children in a school situation, but you do. Uh, you could be, yeah. When it ends, it ends. <laughs> it's just interesting because, like, I'm I, I'm potty training a, a 13 year old, and yeah. it's <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> interesting how um, I'm trying to figure out related to the theory. And you're also trying to figure out where it's all gone awry in the previous management, because in my experience with the teachers having to potty train a 13 year old kid is that something really went awry earlier on, and part of it is a psychological issue now. It's not yeah. just their lowered IQ at all. Okay. And it may, in fact, be a, a being stuck in the anal phase. They're often very stubborn, angry kids that they have low IQs that won't toilet train until their pivotal kids are older, and not until they're in a situation maybe disconnected from their parents. You have to remember that these were very difficult children at two and three, and when you would expect to try to train your children, and there's been a parental, mm -hmm. <coughs> a parent-child rift, mm -hmm. there's been an anal battle, but there's nobody to master it inside, you know, or they don't have it. So what you've got is now a combination of a lowered IQ and a developmental phase that couldn't be transversed for whatever reason, and it has to be a very creative undertaking. Okay. Certainly not because the anal sphincter wasn't controllable. Right. Well, she would know that, but but probably not. It's probably, you know, part of it is still a developmental stage. Well, uh, that, that they should have gone through. Maybe at four, maybe at five, but no. Thankfully, I've been successful with this one child and make a big deal every time it, it, he masters the... Remember, and I, you know, that a lot of a child's ability to toilet train has to do with, you know, they wish to be like you, clean and tidy, mm -hmm. cozy and dry, you know, whatever. And their development, the normal child, develops a certain amount of disgust. It's not that the mother all the way through their infancy goes, eh, you stink. But they learn a kind of a gradual, mm, right? Oh, honey, you kind of smell. We better go change those pants. You know, that kind of thing. It's harder to incorporate with a lowered IQ in a way that's useful and for a parent not to get into a terrible battle about it as they get bigger. There's nothing angrier than some of them in our intermediate school, the mothers of eight-year-olds who are pooping in their pants. Yeah. That's very hard to clean up. Sure. So a battle begins. And you've got a tangle. Okay. Let alone that a lot of that, I think, depends on the quality of the relationship of the child to the mother. Mm -hmm. yes. And if yeah. you are repetitive, you are ready to understand what she wants and why she's saying it or why she doesn't like it, <coughs> and you wish to comply with her, may not, it is probably still there to some degree, but not to the same degree of an homage.